Good morning, everybody. Can everybody hear me? Thumbs up. Good. Um, welcome to this webinar. This is the first in our planned series of quarterly uh, webinars on hot topics in financial regulation. Um, and the first topic that we have selected um, is the strategically key topic of digital transformation. Now, Mason Hayes and Curran has established a cross-disciplinary financial products advisory team, um, which covers regulation, privacy, um, commercial contracts, and the myriad of legal and regulatory issues that can arise when financial institutions are seeking to develop innovative digital products and services. We've been closely tracking the EU's digital finance package, um, and we've published a number of articles, which some of you may have seen, on key items of forthcoming legislation that will be relevant to financial institutions, including the AI regulation and DORA. Uh, but we thought it was time to get down to some of the practical issues that arise. And so we based this webinar on a case study approach to try to tease out some of the real life challenges and opportunities that digital transformation projects and in financial institutions present. So we're privileged first to introduce our guest speaker today, who's Sarah Brown, CRO and Head of Compliance for EMEA at Stripe Technologies Europe. Um, and Sarah, I mean, obviously Stripe is a highly digitally evolved organization and Sarah's in a unique position to give us an overview of the challenges and opportunities for regulated um, entities in digital transformation projects. I, we're then going to hand over um, to my colleague, Sarah Clunan, senior associate in our financial regulatory team and a key member of our financial products advisory team, who's going to moderate a panel um, to discuss the case study. Um, and that panel will be composed of Ushin Tobin, partner in our privacy practice, um, Dermot McGurr, partner in our commercial contracts practice, and Rowena Fitzgerald, um, co-head of the financial regulation practice. Um, and of course, Sarah Brown, our guest speaker, will join that panel. Um, just before I hand over to Sarah Brown, our guest speaker um, for today, um, the Q&A function, please don't forget, there are opportunities for you to raise your questions. Do raise your questions. Um, and Sarah Clunan will be um, moderating the discussion of those Q&As further on down the line. So without further ado, I hand over to Sarah Brown. Thank you so much, Liam, and good morning, everyone. Really delighted to join you this morning to talk through this really important topic around digital transformation. So I'm only going to take a couple of moments of your time before we get to the active panel discussion. And just by way of some opening comments, I'd love to focus on maybe three areas for the next few minutes. So first of all, to talk a little bit around the regulatory considerations for digital transformation. Secondly, the risk management lens. And thirdly, the critical area of culture and impacts on people associated with such transformations. So first, if we look maybe at some of the regulatory considerations, and I suppose in a nutshell, whether your regulated business is going fully digital or you're remaining with a combination of many different channels through which you will provide your products and services, we know that the basic regulatory expectations apply. However, we also know that there are additional considerations in respect of, for example, consumer protection. And the recent Consumer Protection Outlook report from the Central Bank of Ireland called out technology-driven risks to consumer protection as one of the top five cross-sectoral risks that they're looking at in this sphere. And to get into this in a little bit more detail, the CBI notes the opportunities that technology presents in terms of access to and choice of financial service products, however, is also mindful of the risks including cyber, risks of IT system weaknesses, outages, fraud risks, risks associated with outsourcing, to name but a few examples of what the CBI sees as technology-driven risks. This probably leads us nicely to some of the broader risk considerations. And at the very highest level, I think about framing this under a few different headings. So first of all, 
the business strategy within your firm leading to the decision to make a digital transformation. Secondly, the risks associated with the execution or delivery of the transformation. And thirdly, and interestingly, the risks associated with the post transformation operating model. So I think it's fair to say whether you're joining us this morning from your role in a payments firm or a bank or an insurance company or any other firm, we all know that the, the fundamental underpinning business strategy is really foundational to identifying the risks associated with the decision to digitally transform your business. And I know this sounds very simple and intuitive, but I think it's worth emphasizing that starting with the business strategy really gives us the best chance of getting to the heart of identifying and assessing and hopefully mitigating risks associated with the strategy that if they're not addressed up front, really have the potential to derail a successful execution of the transformation later down the line. Examples of such risks might be a competitor perspective. So how does what your firm is planning to do to execute maybe stack up with the propositions of that of your competitors? Risks around your business model, perhaps the external macroeconomic environment within which your firm is operating. And I think there can also be a lot of benefit in really undertaking an exercise to effectively test your strategy with your customers. So really ensuring that your customers are at the forefront of your objectives in digital transformation. And I think this can really introduce some early insights and learnings. If we move on then to the risks associated with actually executing the digital transformation, like strategic risk, the considerations here will be very specific to each of your firms. And I think these can include areas like how the transformation will be executed. So are you relying on maybe an in-house or an outsourced third party IT provider? Do the teams who will be running the transformation actually have experience of transformation type initiatives and also your capacity and capabilities to actually continue to run your business while you're transforming it at the same time? And we know that execution of digital transformation is not always the easiest thing to do. Um, top of mind here around risks associated with this really covers across people, process and technology and how to execute a really enduring and often fundamental transformation within your business at the same time as running what can be fast paced businesses in terms of your BAU agendas is certainly a challenge that merits upfront attention. And now we get to considering what I might call some of the risks very specific to the circumstances and context of transformation. So, for example, are you migrating data? Will you be parallel running old and new systems for a period, maybe introducing some coexistence risk? And how do you ensure that your business and your customers are sufficiently informed about the impacts and benefits of the upcoming transformation? And finally, in this section on the post transformation operating model, what's the vision associated with the transformation that's driving the business efforts? Is it to become a lower cost firm? Is it to try and maybe lower the risk profile of the firm? Is it to provide additional channels and products to meet your customer needs or something else? And really, this is about setting clear objectives and key result areas for the transformation and really tracking these through to ensure that they're truly delivered. I think then moving back to the regulatory space, the broader regulatory landscape is certainly consistently evolving with ongoing new regulatory change, whether this is brand new regulation or maybe updates to existing regulatory obligations and expectations. And this can introduce risk in its own right. Digital transformations can take a period of time, sometimes years to implement and fully reap the benefits and this can all be in the context of a somewhat moving target of regulatory change. Strong program and project management discipline, scope and cost management, and forward-looking upstream planning to manage regulatory change risk can all help to mitigate this. And finally, I'd love to say a word on perhaps one of the most important and truly transformational agents of change within the business, and this is culture. Transformation is difficult and bringing colleagues and stakeholders on the journey to the end state vision is critical in this regard. Really taking time to understand your stakeholder perspectives, 
the risks that they see with the proposed transformation and how to appreciate and take into account their vital viewpoints is critical. Demonstrating the right culture focused on your customers and their needs is truly enabled by investing in this. And I think it's a really long term contributory factor to the success or otherwise of the transformation effort. So thank you so much for giving me a few minutes to speak this morning. Delighted to hand back to our MC, Sarah Clunan, and I'm looking forward to what promises to be a really great panel discussion. Great, <clears throat> thanks, Sarah. I'll just wait for everyone else to enter the panel just before we kick off. Um, so as we mentioned there at the start of the session with Dean's introduction, we're going to look at a case study today. So on the first slide, I'm just going to set out some basic facts and then we'll move through some of the proposals under the case study and we'll pause um, so I can grill the panelists um, to see if we can figure out some of the key risks or issues that the, the fact pattern brings up. So this first slide here just sets out that we have a banking group here that's based in a European country that's opened up X Bank, a uh, imaginative name, um, in order to create a hub for the purposes of testing out different products and initiatives before they roll it out across the EU. So XBank holds a banking license with the Central Bank of Ireland. And we've all heard of the digital challenger banks um, coming onto the scene. So, you know, they are obviously offering a bit more competition to the more traditional players. And XBank obviously recognizes this and realizes it has to compete. So its CEO, John Murphy, has extensive plans over the next couple of years to make sure they transform XBank into a highly digital um, competitor of those digital challenger banks. So if we move on then to the next slide, um, which sets out some additional uh, plans that John Murphy has, um, has outlined. So the plan is to enter into a agreement with an Indian cloud provider named New Cloud for the purposes of operating this new platform that John has envisaged. And um, the oper operating platform is going to be cloud-based and it's going to hold all of the customer data. Um, the platform is going to allow for fully remote onboarding of new customers of XBank and it'll also be used for account management. And it's solely going to use biometric identification data. Um, and John, John also has plans to introduce um, eye scanner verification, so very modern. Um, the current credit assessment system is going to be replaced by a more streamlined, shiny category based system, and it's going to involve uh, categorizing customers into different, I suppose, lending categories um, based on profiling that's going to be using a specific algorithm. So if we just pose, pause there and um, the first question we have is for Ushin on the GDPR side of things. So. Is there anything under GDPR that's going to prevent us um, hosting or leaving that data on the cloud in India? And if so, what are the contractual provisions on data pro processing that we need to ensure are in place in order to mitigate that risk? Thanks, hey Sarah. Um, morning, everyone. Um, so I guess the starting point here is the fact that under European law and under the GDPR, um, it is technically unlawful to move data outside of the European Union. Or the European Economic Area. Now, this is one of those great examples where there is a rule, there are many, many exceptions, and the exceptions completely swallow the rule. So can you use an Indian cloud provider um, for these purposes? Well, under GDPR, yes, you can, but there's a lot of work involved to get there. So you would effectively need to try and figure out how are you going to lawfully transfer data from Europe to India um, to, to deal with what we call the transfer issue. There's a couple of steps you would need to take here to get comfortable that this can be done. The first step would be to identify what agreements you need in place between the Irish bank and then the Indian service provider. There are standard contracts that the European Commission have released called standard contractual clauses, very imaginatively titled, and the drafting is painful to read, so be grateful if you never had to look at them. And SECs are sort of like this magic agreement that if you use them, they effectively are deemed to provide sufficient protection for personal data to enable you to transfer that personal data outside of Europe. So the starting point for a deal like this is you would need to use SECs. Um, however, 
things are a little bit more complicated than just drafting the right agreement and sticking it in the drawer. A practice that frankly was engaged in for decades. Um, what you would also need to do is analyze the nature of the transfer from Ireland to India. And this is something that is both required by the new SCCs themselves, which, which came out last year, and is also required by case law from the European Court of Justice, the, the famous or infamous Schrems II case in particular. So what you would also need to do in a case like this is something called a transfer impact assessment or a TIA in the jargon. And that effectively means that you need to look at what data, what data is being sent to India, how it's being protected, and what safeguards are in place. So what that means in practice is you're going to have to do a fair bit of vendor due diligence uh, under from a GDPR perspective, get comfortable that you're getting appropriate safeguards um, from the Indian provider, and then document everything and effectively ensure the business can get comfortable that um, you know, that you, uh, that the data is adequately protected when it goes to, um, from, from Europe to India. Uh, another point that you'd want to look at from a GDPR perspective, uh, even before we get to the uh, financial services regulatory requirements, uh, would be the assurance, the contractual assurances you're getting around data security and, and government access to data. And it's pretty typical in contracts to have the, you know, the SCCs, which are standard documents everyone uses, but then on top of that to also negotiate additional warranties and reps around data security. And in particular, you want to get comfortable that the vendor you're working will in fact keep the data secure and practice and that they have appropriate technological measures in place. So I guess to summarize all that, can you use an Indian cloud? Yes. Will it be a lot of work? Yes. Um, so it, it can be done, but um, you know, it's, it's not going to be easy. Thanks, Oshie. No rest for the wicked. Um, the next question is for Dermot. So what do you see as the challenges for X Bank when they're entering into contracts like this with um, new cloud? Um, thanks, Sarah. Um, hi there, everybody. Um, so the challenges, I mean, it is going to be a relatively complex agreement. You're procuring relatively complex technology, therefore you're going to have a complex agreement. Um, it is a new arrangement for the customer party here as well, so there's going to be an element of uncertainty around that as well. So there is going to be an investment of time, there is going to be an investment of resource, you're going to need to have a strong project team. You're going to want good technical lead, good commercial lead. Um, and it goes without saying good uh, legal advice as well. Um, the usual issues when you're contracting for any complex tax solution are going to apply. Um, so you're going to need to get into the weeds on the services, the specification, uh, the acceptance provisions. <clears throat> you're going to need to think about um, mitigating against the risk of vendor lock-in because you always have to think about the end of the term when you're drafting the agreement as well so you're going to need to look at the exit provisions you're going to need to have detailed exit planning obligations you're going to want to look at intellectual property and the ownership of things which are developed during the term of the agreement because what you really need to watch out for is that at the end of the term you're sort of stuck with the supplier you have because it's far too um too much effort to move to somebody else and part of that could be ip ownership rights or licenses um you're gonna have the usual tussles around caption exclusions and liability like you would expect in any agreement like this um and you're gonna have to focus on your termination rights as well make sure that you have actionable termination rights that's always the key both pre go live and post go live as well because you need to have control of whether you go live or not because these projects as Sarah touched on earlier, are a big change for the business and you want to have absolute control over whether you actually go live with it or not. Um, so that links to your termination rights. Then to the extent this is an outsourcing, which we expect it will be, then what you need to do is you need to layer in the outsourcing guideline requirements. Um, so for here, that's gonna be the EBA outsourcing and the CBI outsourcing guidelines. Um, well, the good news on that is that those two sets of guidelines are very, very similar. The CBI guidelines are based essentially on the EBA guidelines from a third party contracting perspective. Um, so there are relatively limited differences. There are a few discrete points which you do need to watch out for. Um, and actually as well, the CBI guidelines offer some quite helpful uh, clarifications on a few points on EBA as well. Um, it would be a different situation if the client we were talking about here, the firm we were talking about here, 
was perhaps subject to some of the other outsourcing guidelines, so say ISMA cloud or um, uh, EOPA cloud, or actually if there was a cross-jurisdictional element as well, you may have guideline requirements from other regulators. Um, because the challenge then is you have this issue uh, called the patchwork quilt problem that you have perhaps two or three different guideline requirements which apply to your contract, which all deal with very, very similar issues, but in slightly different ways. And some are more onerous than others. So what you need to do essentially is work out right for each of these different areas, which is the most onerous. And then that becomes your threshold, uh, your high watermark that you need to make sure your contract um, uh, uh, reflects. So the easiest thing for X Bank here would be if it had its own template agreement with a playbook which sits beside that, which is drafted to be in compliance with, um, so in this instance, EBA and CBI. Um, and then it's, um, I was gonna say straightforward, but it's not that straightforward, but it, it's easier that you're, it's based on your own terms. You know if the supplier pushes back on certain issues, you've got fallbacks ready to go. Um, the more challenging approach is where you're contracting on the supplier's terms, which is relatively common. Um, in that instance, what you need to do is develop a, um, a map, essentially, so a regulatory map of all the guideline requirements that apply to your contract and then map those against the supplier terms. And then you work out what the gaps are and you address those, obviously, by markups to the agreement. Um, the challenge is more generally, I suppose, on trying to sort of practically implement the EBA and the CBI guidelines. Um, to be honest, that's probably a session in itself. Um, I, could, I, I, could, I could talk for another hour, I think, on that. But I mean, just sort of focusing in on a couple of examples, two of the most, um, most challenging areas where we see supplier pushback in practice is around the audit rights and the termination rights. Um, so the audit rights, they talk about full access to all relevant business premises and unrestricted rights of inspection and audit. So suppliers look at that and think it's onerous and invasive, um, and that's fair enough uh, because it is, um, and it's drafted to be like that. That is the intention. Um, that doesn't mean that you can't look at reasonable accommodations around that. So once you have those principles enshrined in your agreement, you can look at, well, how do we deal with the, the supplier's concerns, which can be fair, um, fair concerns. So you can look at the frequency of the audits, for example. You could look at obligations about mitigating uh, disruption to the supplier's business. You can look at the notice requirements, um, although noting there is, you know, if it's a regulatory required audit or, or it's a risk or, 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 sorry, an emergency situation, they may need to be deviated with from. The, the final thing, it, which you can do to deal with supplier concerns, but should perhaps only be used if you're really up against it, is to look at the commercials. So the guideline requirements are silent on the commercials. Um, by commercials, I mean the cost of doing one of these audits, the supplier's time of doing one of these audits. Um, so if you're in a really difficult situation where you just can't get them to agree, then that is an area you can look at. Obviously not popular from the customer party side, because from the customer's perspective, you shouldn't have to pay for compliance, um, which is fair as well. But as I say, it should be, um, if you're in a difficult position, it is something you can look up. You've also got the option of third party certifications and pooled audits. So these become really, really important when you're dealing with large companies, so the big cloud uh, providers, for example. Um, they are allowed for in the guidelines and, sh and should be used where it is appropriate to do so. The key issue with those, though, in particular from an EBA perspective, is that you can't rely on them exclusively over time. So you do need to um, maintain the right or have a path through um, to carry out an on-site audit as well. Um, and then just a quick word on the termination rights. So, I mean, unsurprisingly, suppliers aren't, aren't fans of these. Um, you do um, receive quite a lot of pushback on them. The challenge with them, even from the customer's perspective, is that there's a list of them and they're, most of them aren't really drafted in the type of language that we would use in contracts. They're more of a sort of principle kind of level. So what you need to do is work out, right, well, how do I practically implement these into my agreement? Um, so if we take, for example, one of the more 
sort of principle based ones. There's one which requires you have to or requires that the customer party has a right to terminate where there is an impediment capable of altering performance um, identified. So, I mean, what does that mean? Um, what my view on it is, is that you look at the traditional audit rights that you would have anyway. So, um, termination for material breach, termination for insolvency, termination for change of control, termination for service level failure, they are all impediments capable of altering performance. Um, so in my experience, the trick is for, for the customer party to work out, right, well, in a sort of um, well-drafted outsourcing agreement, which is a sort of relatively high-risk arrangement, what are the termination rights that I would need? And then once you've established that, then you map those against the requirements of the EBA and the CBI in this instance and work out what the delta is. And actually, in a lot of instances, it won't be that much. And there are a few specific points that you'll just need to call out. Um, yeah, but as I say, it's it's about starting with right, well, what do I need? And then looking at the requirements and making sure they marry up. Um, so in summary, then, I think It'll be a complex agreement, sure. It'll be time consuming, sure. But I don't think it's something which um, an experienced team uh, won't be able to uh, sort of guide you through. Okay, that's great. Thanks, Dermot, really comprehensive. Um, next up is Rowena. So there's obviously a lot going on with John's plans from a regulatory perspective, and especially as a new, a newly authorized credit institution, you know, X Bank is probably gonna have a few things to look at. And I suppose the key things that jump out are probably outsourcing controls and governance. Is there anything there that you think you need to draw out for the audience? Yeah, thanks, Sarah. Um, yeah, like you mentioned, look, there's a lot going on here from, from a regulatory perspective. Like you said, thankfully the entity here already has secured its license from the central bank. So, you know, that's one significant hurdle behind it. Um, but in terms of the case study, as you said, look, there's a good bit to, to take into account. Um, and a lot of that will center around governance and the, the controls the bank has in place to satisfy its regulatory obligations when it comes to outsourcing. So Dermot has touched on some of the areas to note around the contracting phase of the outsourcing, but I think it's very important to note that there's a number of key things that the, the bank needs to take into account before it even gets to the, the contracting phase. So for a start, the, the bank should take a look at its outsourcing policy. Um, and if it doesn't have one, now is the time to put that in place and have it reviewed and approved by its board. Um, and the bank will need to, to look, like, look at the EBA guidelines and the CBI guidelines on outsourcing. And one of the key things out of those guidelines is that the bank should carry out a pre-outsourcing analysis. Um, so before it gets to the point of entering into any agreement, it should assess whether the services here are critical or important. Um, Taking a look at the case study as it involves outsourcing to the cloud of the bank's operational platform, I think it'd be very difficult to argue that this isn't a critical or, or important outsourcing, because I just I expect here that if the platform were to fail, that would have a serious impact on the continuity of the bank's services to its customers. So I think you'd need to treat this as being a critical outsourcing. The bank should also consider things like whether the service provider it's dealing with would need any type of financial services license itself to provide the services unlikely to be relevant in this particular instance, but it still should be factored in by the bank at the outset. Um, and like Sarah Brown mentioned, you know, the bank should also identify and assess and document all of the risks related to the outsourcing arrangement. That's, that's crucial for the bank. Um, the bank also has to make sure that it carries out appropriate due diligence on the service provider here and documents that because effectively the bank has to make sure that the service provider can provide the services to the standards expected of the bank, um, noting that the bank can't, can't delegate any responsibility for that. Um, and the bank also has to make sure that it can identify and assess any conflicts of interest that might arise with, with the outsourcing. Um, and like, like Dermot mentioned, there's a few additional things that the bank should look at at the outset and then also build into the contracting phase. So, you know, how's the bank going to look at the, the, the service provider's ongoing performance and how are they going to assess that? You know, what happens if there's going to be changes that affect the service provider's financial position? If that deteriorates, you know, where does that leave the bank? Um, how is the bank going to deal with any audits that it's going to carry out? You know, records, how is the bank going to expect the service provider to maintain records? And how is the bank itself going to, to maintain records? 
And very importantly, again, this is something that Dermot touched on, the bank will need to consider how the exit strategy and any termination process are going to be managed. Um, for the bank, it, it's important for it to note that, you know, it needs to have a documented exit plan in place for each critical function it outsource. It outsources, so that should take into account things like, you know, possible service or interruptions on the part of the service provider, or if there's an unexpected termination of the outsourcing agreement, where will that leave the bank and what will it do? Um, so both the EBA guidelines and the central bank guidelines make it very clear that, you know, when the bank or any regulated entity is outsourcing functions, it can't result in the delegation of the firm's responsibilities. So firms are expected to maintain sufficient substance. They can't become letterbox entities. So in short, you know, the bank here couldn't outsource absolutely everything to a third party. Um, and it will be expected to designate a senior staff member who's responsible for managing and overseeing the risks of the outsourcing. Um, and like Dermot mentioned, the, the, the central bank guidelines are, are helpful on some aspects because they make the central bank's expect, expectations around outsourcing a bit clearer. Um, so there's a couple of additional things that the, the central bank expects. So the central bank would expect the bank here to have a documented outsourcing strategy in place. Um, and obviously ensure that, you know, even though the bank isn't outsourcing, they can still meet their conditions of authorization on an ongoing, ongoing basis. Um, the bank here should have an outsourcing register again, and, you know, this outsourcing arrangement is added to that. Um, and because we're dealing with the bank, they should ensure that there's no impact on the resolvability of the bank because as a result of, of the, res the, the, the the outsourcing here. So like I mentioned, there's a lot to take into account even before getting to the contracting phase. And that really ties heavily into the firm's governance arrangements um, and the outsourcing controls it puts in place. Um, I'll park it there, Sarah, because I could probably talk about this all day, which wouldn't be helpful for anybody else. <laughs> Um, I'm going to go back to Ushin here um, again. So can X Bank insist on the biometric verification that it's, it's suggested or that John has um, um, come up with? And more generally, from a GDPR perspective, you know, what, what things does X Bank need to look out for? Sure. I'll take the biometric question first. Um, short answer is not without significant risk. Um, why do I say that? So under GDPR, there's a category of information that has the delightful title of special categories of data. It used to be called sensitive personal data back in the day. Biometric information, which would include eye scanner or uh, retina information, is a form of a special category of data. What does that mean in practice? Well, the basic rule is that you are not allowed to process special categories of data unless either one, you have obtained an individual's explicit consent, and I'll come back to what that means in a second, or alternatively, uh, you know, the, or alternatively, if uh, one needs to fall within certain fairly tightly defined exceptions um, in the GDPR, one of which is that the processing is necessary for reasons of substantial public interest based on EU or EU member state law. So for present purposes, there are basically two options available around the biometric. Option one would be to take the position that the bank, that, that, that the use of the biometric information is uh, necessary for reasons of substantial public interest and is in fact based on uh, applicable law. From a GDPR standpoint, that is a high risk strategy to adopt. Um, but you know, if an organization wanted to go that route, you would need to really dig into the weeds as to why precisely you are doing the biometric verification. And you would basically have to show that you are being you know, required or pushed to use this strategy by a regulator or by statute. So I think you would have difficulty arguing that you have to, I think you'd have difficulty on insisting on biometric verification, unless you could say that it truly is required by law or that regulators are heavily pushing the organization in this direction. Um, particularly, I've spoken to some London-based organizations that seem to be of the view the FCA is pushing them in that direction. So, you know, there is increasing talk around, you know, forcing individuals to use biometric verification. Um, and it may well help from an FS or financial services regulatory perspective because of the quality of the verification. But you know, uh, I'm primarily a data protection lawyer, and from a data protection perspective, forcing somebody to provide biometric uh, information so as to access a banking service is the kind of thing that is likely to lead to a lot of scrutiny from the Data Protection Commission and other regulators. So, you know, if you wanted to 
go the biometric, the mandatory biometric route, you know, you need to look at it very, very carefully. And I think there will be quite a lot of risk from a GDPR perspective. The other option then, which is, um, you know, a little unwieldy, but eminently doable from a GDPR perspective would be to get consent for the biometric verification. The way you would do this effectively is you would make it optional for individuals to um, to go the biometric route. I should stress that from a GD when we're talking about consent under GDPR, we don't mean that there's something buried in the T's and C's that somebody has agreed to. We mean that there has to be a very clear uh, binary choice presented to an individual. Here's what's going to happen. Do you agree to it? Yes, no. Um, so you basically have to give people that sort of clear option as to whether they want to uh, go the biometric verification route. And if they do, great. We do, there's some technical issues we need to deal with around the design of that flow within the app, but generally it, it's, it's pretty straightforward. Um, you know, one thing that I'm often asked is, okay, well, to what extent can we incentivize people to go the biometric route? Um, because you know, it's easier for the business um, and it's more secure. You know, in general, you can give people, you, you can make it more attractive to go for a biometric, go for biometric verification, but you cannot penalize uh, individuals for declining to consent because the the GDPR is quite and um, pretty regulatory guidance is quite clear that you know taking punitive actions that cause detriment to an individual because they withheld their consent is 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 not appropriate and it will ultimately uh, invalidate any consents that you purported to obtain. So you know the way I would sometimes think about this is you could tell people well look if you 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 have you two options here you can go the biometric route we can verify this and have this done in thirty seconds. Or you can go the traditional route, and it might take a, a day or two, and it's going to delay, you know, account opening or like sometimes long. Um, so you know, from that perspective, you know, you kind of just give people, you know, the, the safest approach, I guess, to summarize this from from my standpoint is you give people a choice, biometric or not. And if you go that route, you're pretty safe from a GDPR perspective. If you're going to push people into biometrics, you know, things get pretty dicey from 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 a data protection standpoint, and you need to be you need to tread very very carefully. I'd never say never, but be be very careful. Um, in terms then of the more general considerations, I mean, I, I, I you know, there's low, we, obviously I could talk about this for hours, but the, the point I do want to hone in on is the third, um, kind of the third point, this idea of, uh, you know, doing credit profiling. Can you do that or not? Uh, yeah, you can do this. Uh, you, you can absolutely profile your customers for the purposes of, of identifying, um, you know, suitability for loans. But like everything with the GDPR, um, you know, there's, you need to be careful, and that there are certain <clears throat> substantive steps one would want to take here. Um, you know, sort of the high level consideration I would have here. First thing would be, uh, you know, you'd want to do a what's called a data protection impact assessment, where effectively you look at how you're gathering the data, you look at how you're profiling people, and you know, you identify any risks that they may be exposed to, and you try and control for those risks. So, you know, documentation is key. Um, from a more substantive legal perspective, the big principle to be mindful here, uh, mindful of here, would be the EU's uh, the EU's rules around what's called automated decision making, and these are effectively a set of rules in the GDPR that only, that apply where you've got a computer making a decision, where that decision either has legal effects or other significant effects that are basically equivalent to legal effects. Now there is regulatory guidance that says that. Uh, decisions around whether to advance or withhold credit or the terms on which credit will be provided are seen as significantly affecting an individual. So on the face of it, the automated decision making rules come into play where you are using some sort of credit scoring system. But like everything, the, the devil is in the detail here. And again, there's sort of two different paths you can go down as a company. Option one would be to, you know, do credit scoring or profiling so as to assist a loan officer in doing their job. If you are doing this sort of basic analysis, most likely you are not going to be subject to the specific rules in automated decision making. The reason I say that is because the ADM or automated decision making rules apply where a computer is making the decision. So if a computer or an algorithm is simply providing support to a human and it is the human exercising their judgment to make the decision, then you are not likely not caught by the automated decision making rules. I should stress because I've been asked this quite a lot is to what exactly like how much judgment does that human have to make uh, or, or provide so is it you know if you've got someone who has no clue what's going on who just pushes a button to approve what the computer has said is that enough short answer is no you need to have someone actually exercising real professional judgment here but you know they absolutely can be supported by by the computer so that's sort of the first option if you go that route we don't really have to worry about automated decision making 
The second option then is to uh, effectively completely automate the process. And that's probably the more interesting option. And, and that's effectively a situation where the decision as to whether or not uh, credit is given or the terms on which credit is given are, are made by computer. Can you do that under GDPR? Well, yes, if you're careful, is the answer. Um, the, it, it's often, there's often this misconception that the GDPR prohibits this sort of automated decision making, it, it doesn't, it just imposes a lot of requirements around it. And um, so, you know, you need to show that certain preconditions apply before you can go this route. One of them is that the processing is necessary to enter into a contract. So that's likely met if somebody has requested credit. And then the other, um, you know, a big area, which is what I would focus on in practice, is that you have to show that there's suitable safeguards in place around the automated decision making to protect the individual. And those safeguards fall into basically two rough buckets. The first one is the right to appeal. So if somebody gets, you know, uh, a, a result that's sent back to them and they think it's nonsense, like say it's a very stable business and they're being quoted an interest rate of like 36%, you know, they should have a right to, you know, appeal that. And then at that stage, a human has to re re review everything. And a human who has the ability to consider submissions or points made by, by in this case, the loan applicant, and then, you know, reconsider the entire decision. So you have to have that meaningful right to appeal. The other um, set of requirements then are more really around transparency for the modeling and also, you know, making sure that the model that's powering all this is properly designed. So from a transparency perspective, there's this real concern in Europe around the explainability of automated decisions. Um, and this is going to be a real theme in the next couple of years as we're moving more into a machine learning world where computers make decisions, but we don't really know why they've made the decision. But, you know, so, so you're going to have to basically explain the steps that are explain the logic of the model as to why it's uh, reaching certain conclusions or not. And then crucially, you have to be comfortable that the model is actually fair, that it does its job, and that it doesn't discriminate. Um, and this is something that's been really topical, particularly in the US, where it's where, you know, independent testing has shown that models that discriminate against certain groups. Um, so, you know, when you're building the model, you'd really want to stress test it to make sure it does act, it does what it says in the tin, and it's not, you know, it doesn't have built in biases. Um, but if you do that, you know, and, and you have all these systems and processes in place, yeah, you could, you absolutely could effectively uh, move to a point where the, the loan decisions are being made by a, a computer in the first instance. Great, thanks, Oshin. And um, moving back to Sarah, there's obviously a lot there that we've discussed. Are there any particular points, you know, given your background and your experience that you want to mention? I just think listening to everything that Dermot, um, Oshin, and Rowena have um, spoken to, what was going through my mind, Sarah, was just the complexity of all of this. And from the point of view of the practical execution of what we have here within the case study the skills and experience that's needed to do that. I think you've really drawn out great examples of some of that complexity. So whether we go back to the outsourcing discussion and, and the debate we were having about, you know, the rights of audit, et cetera, and not just setting up the right outsourcing framework, if I call it that, but what the ongoing oversight and execution of that is and how to have the skill sets within your business to do that. And then everything that we've spoken to here around the biometrics and the credit piece, I think you've given great examples around the really transformative nature of this and the skills and capabilities that are needed. Probably the other piece I was, I was thinking about was actually capacity within existing businesses. So businesses that are going through a transformation like the case study here, as Sarah points to, and actually the capacity even on the technical side to execute this. This is a, a really big program of work that's illustrated by this case study. And I think we'll probably coming back to the earlier points around strategy, introduce really interesting discussions for the company about how they prioritize a program of this nature, you know, against what is probably already a very extensive BAU IT agenda for the company. So I think they're great examples of, of some really challenging practical application to this. Yeah, John's ambitious. You have to say that for him. Great man. Um, if we move on then to the next slide, um, there hopefully won't be as many issues. The first was quite heavy, but here John um, wants to introduce that new credit assessment service. And he hopes to use some cutting edge AI machine learning tools in order to tailor that process and the purposes of the credit assessment and approval. 
Um, and he's also looking at options of acquiring and implementing that system himself. Um, but John also wants to kind of revolutionize the customer's experience with banking more generally. And he wants to increase the non-interest fee income that can be generated. So he's looking to launch robo advisory services for customers. And he's going to offer parametric trigger-based fully digital life and non-life insurance products. Try and say that time, three times fast. Um, but that robo advisory service will also be AI based. So I think we'll just pause here and maybe go back to the panelists and uh, consider a couple of points. So we'll go back to Dermot here. So contracting for AI products, new initiatives or services is obviously a relatively new area that firms are going to have to look at. Um, and what do you think is the best way for them to approach that? Yeah, um, so I think that's that's absolutely true. For most businesses, um, there may be some elements of sort of relatively simple sort of AI being used at the lower end of the scale, but for most businesses at the minute, there isn't large scale adoption. So it certainly is at an early stage. What I look at are the contractual issues. So you're trying to procure an AI product or service. What do you need to think about? It's interesting though, from um, uh, the comments from Oshin there, a lot of the issues you, you need to think about from a regulatory perspective are the same issues you need to see reflected in your contract as well. So, um, I mean, there is the uncertainty point and what that can lead to is that practice varies. Um, there can be a tendency from some suppliers to say, my AI product is, um, unpredictable the outcomes are unpredictable because it is an ai solution therefore i'm excluding all liability arising from the use of the service um, obviously from a customer party perspective that's just not going to be good enough um, and isn't a basis in which you can contract for a sort of critical service um, which this would be so what then should the customer do um, and again this comes back to the link to the regulatory requirements the key things are due diligence around the technology itself, achieving transparency on the technology, um, accountability in the sense of having accountability in your contract, and then ongoing testing, monitoring, and oversight. So you'll see there's themes from what we were talking about in the EBA guidelines, the CBI guidelines, and then what Ashim was saying from a broader regulatory perspective, it's the same type of issues that you need to think about and see reflected in your agreement. So by due diligence in this context, what I mean is due diligence of the technology itself. So how does it work? How does it arrive at its outcomes? Um, and actually getting into the detail on that, because what you want to achieve is a transparency. So a clear understanding. So going in and um, uh, opening the black box, as it were, that you're, you're aiming to understand Right, what elements of this are in a party's control and what actually aren't, what is actually unpredictable. Um, and I say a party there intentionally because it may be in your counterparty's control, the actual contracting party, the supplier, or it may be a third party equally who may be in control of some element of the service. Um, so it's, it's really important to get a clear understanding of that at the start and get to that level of transparency because then what you do is you achieve um, accountability by translating that into your contract. Um, so that means a fairly granular detail on, in the specification, who's responsible for what, on the outcomes of the product or service, who's responsible for what, where does the data come from, importantly, and that links back to that third party point as well, who's responsible for that, um, who owns the IP, both that leads into the system and actually with some more, some more advanced AI solutions, which are actually developing things, who owns the IP in that and equally who's responsible for that. Um, and then where there are third party dependencies involved, what are they and who's responsible for those third parties if something goes wrong? Um, so this granular approach is really important to achieving that element of um, uh, accountability in your contract and actually specifying it in your agreement. Because if you're responsible for something in a contract, you're obviously liable for it. So that's sort of getting the detail right. And then you look at your liability clause itself. Um, 
And I suppose the comforting thing, or the perhaps not, is that the usual rules will apply. The supplier party is going to seek to have the lowest cap it can, exclude as much as it can. The, uh, the customer party is going to seek the opposite. And actually, the main thing which is going to determine the outcome of those discussions is the strength of the party's positions, you know, as is usually the case. The one issue with AI, though, which is different, is this issue about where there is genuinely an element which is unpredictable, which is in control of, or the AI is in control of that. I mean, in my experience, when you actually get into the sort of detail on these, a lot of the services offered today have a very, very limited element of that, if any. So that's why that transparency issue is really, really important. Um, so you can't deal with that in your liability clause and there, there needs to be a view taken as to, well, how are we going to deal with that? Is that an excluded type of liability for the supplier, for example? Is it something, is it a risk the customer is going to assume and stuff like that? But at least you're going in there with very strict parameters on what that is and then a clear understanding of how you're going to deal with it. Where you do have elements like that, and equally, Again, this links back to the broader requirements of the EBA and the CBI. Um, it's critical when you have a new service like this, which is perhaps, I'm going back to Sarah's point about the expertise in the business, that perhaps you might not have the sort of the, the, the level of experience that you would need or you would want. The critical thing is that you have reporting, testing, sorry, at the start, before you allow anything to go live, really detailed testing requirements reporting, monitoring, audit rights, um, both at the start and on an ongoing basis. Because the key issue is with, with relatively novel solutions like this, if something goes wrong, you want to catch it early so it doesn't turn into a larger sort of issue. Um, and that's why you need this oversight monitoring um, that I've talked about. So I mean, in summary, it's, it's a very similar concepts to, uh, to what you're required to do under the outsourcing guidelines anyway and actually what any prudent customer would do when they're um, rolling out a new service like this. So it's your due diligence, transparency, accountability, and then managing risks in a proactive way through the agreement. Sarah, is there anything here that you'd like to call out for us? I just think probably listening, Dermot, to what you, you've taken us through very clearly there, it also comes back to, for me, the strategy here. What's the rationale to look to avail of this service and how is this being positioned in the firm's thinking of being of benefit to customers? And I think starting with that and then bringing it back into even if we think about the possibilities that technology like this offers from the perspective of data to the firm. So how will the data avail of the, or how will the firm avail of the data to continually improve and understand their offerings? And also, interestingly, even to manage areas like fraud risk, for example, suddenly the firm has a range of additional data points maybe at its disposal that it mightn't have when it hadn't got this model in place. So I think really interesting in terms of how and the ambitious CEO will look to operationalize on this. Uh, and speaking of our ambitious CEO, the last slide, he has some more plans that we need to quickly look at. So in addition, in addition to el eliminating the paper process involved in onboarding new clients, um, he wish wishes to move all of those records into a digital format. And he set himself a target of, of the end of 2024 in order to get rid of all of that paper. Um, for the non-interest fee-based services that we mentioned earlier, he wants to really aggressively market that stuff via targeted social media campaigns um, and advertisements um, and also using customer profiling. And uh, XBank will also be offering bundled banking packages and the sales staff that John has gathered are gonna be you know, highly motiva motivated and incentivized from a financial perspective to do that kind of cross-selling across the services. Um, and then finally, he doesn't like to rest. John is also going to propose um, some crypto trading platform services um, and he's going to be offering the customers fiat on-ramping services via the use of their bank accounts. Um, and again, he's going to be marketing those services quite heavily and even bundling, with them, bundling them with the existing banking packages that he has. So um, he's absolutely exhausted at this stage. But a few points here again, we're going to have a look at. Uh, Rowena, I'll jump to you again. So when you spoke earlier, obviously there was a big fo focus from a regulatory perspective on outsourcing. 
um, and I suppose the governance side of things, you know, I'm guessing that, you know, there's a few other things that might be red flags here that our friend John is going to have to consider. Yeah, definitely, Sarah. And I think probably every in-house lawyer and compliance person that's listening today is probably thinking if John walked up to their office, they'd throw him out straight away if he came at them with all of this at once. Um, but yeah, you're right that, that there's a huge amount in this. And I might just touch back on the one of the previous slides just around um, the use of biometric data, just to mention a couple of regulatory points on that, and then I'll move on to the other side. So I think, you know, one of the key things that the bank would need to be aware of here is that it has to make sure that new technological innovations keep up and keep in line with their regulatory obligations. So, you know, when you look at biometric data and using that for KYC purposes, from say a legislative AML perspective, neither the legislation or the central bank have sought to impose limits on say the type of information or technology that firms can use to satisfy their anti-money laundering obligations. But the bank has to remember here that its legal obligation is both to identify its customer, you know, make sure they at least know their name, and then use information available to them to verify that entity. So for the bank here, it's not much use to them having the customer's name along with the scan of their eyeball because look, that could belong to anybody. But what the bank could do is have the customer's name, have a copy of their passport with their, with their picture to, to back up their identity, and then have another biometric data layer on top to help you know, match that person's face with their passport. Um, so it's useful in terms of a verification perspective, but from you know KYC onboarding perspective, we're not at the point just yet where you could rely on biometric biometric data alone. Um, the next point I'd like to touch on just relates to robo advice and and the use of AI. So, for the bank when it comes to robo advisory services and using AI, it has to consider whether firstly it's built investment services into its authorization from the central bank, um, and whether the introduction of these services at this point could require a change in its business plan that would require regulatory approval um, from the central bank. Then the bank would need to make sure that any robo advisory tools and AI that, it's, that it uses, they're used in a way that complies with its regulatory requirements. So for example, when it comes to robo advice, is this taking the bank's MIFID obligations into account? And are things like suitability assessments being factored into the product development and the delivery of that advice? Uh, and one thing the case that the case study also touches on is parametric trigger-based insurance. Um, now there's a debate on whether that actually is an insurance product or not, but assuming that it is, the bank should also make sure that it has an insurance distribution license in place before it goes to, to, to sell any type of insurance product. So again, one of the key things for the bank to make sure of here is that <clears throat> its regulatory permissions cover to do what it plans to do. Um, one of the big things I think that jumps out in the case study is bundling and, and the bundling of banking packages. Um, and again, the bank has to make sure that the requirements of the consumer protection code are taken into account um, when it deals with customers that are consumers. So just to know, so firm, regulated firms like the bank are precluded from forcing customers to purchase a second service in order to gain access to the first service. Uh, and you're also precluded from bundling at all unless there's some kind of a cost saving to the customer. So the bank would need to be very careful in particular around that one. Um, and they also need to be very careful when it comes to incentivizing their sales staff um, to sell any of these products. So um, the central bank has published guidelines from 2014 on variable remuneration arrangements for sales staff. Um, and they supplement the requirements of the Consumer Protection Code in this area. Um, and if the bank is looking at rolling out any commission-based program like this, they have to ensure that, firstly, the best interests of the customer are always incorporated into the design of any product or scheme, that the bank doesn't use sales volume, revenue, or targets as the primary measuring criteria for its staff. Um, ultimately, the bank has to avoid promoting a culture of excessive risk-taking within the bank um, and it has to avoid any remuneration practices that might encourage this. Um, and the bank also has to abide by the EBA guidelines on sound remuneration um, and importantly have a remuneration policy in place to do that. Um, and the bank has to remember that it's limited in terms of, say, the variable remuneration that it can offer employees. Um, 
such um, remuneration has to be dependent, or sorry, where remuneration is dependent on cross selling. So, you know, in, in summary, variable remuneration that the bank might pay to its employees can't exceed 50% of an employee's, an employee's pay. So there's a good bit in it. And maybe the last thing I, I, I'll mention um, just relates to the potential rollout of uh, a crypto trading platform. Um, the bank here will need to consider some time that it will take for the relevant group company here um, to register as a virtual asset service provider with the central bank. Um, that's if that group company is going to be an Irish, is Irish based or it's going to have Irish based customers. Um, and the bank will also have to consider any local obligations in each jurisdiction it wishes to operate in. Um, and for the you know, when it comes to the EU at, at the moment, they'll have to do that on a jurisdiction by jurisdiction basis, at least until MICA comes into play, which is a couple of years off at this stage still. So um, one last point just in relation to bundling. And again, I know the case study mentions bundling banking products and crypto products. Um, I would be very, very careful around doing that at the moment because I, I'd see that something that the central bank would really focus in on. Um, particular if there's any consumers involved and you know people might have seen that the central bank came out only two days ago um warning customers again about the risks of, of investing in crypto so i mean that's a very high level run through of my thoughts there um but again if anyone has any questions please do feel to pop them into the the q a function thanks arena um i suppose i'll touch back again last time on the case study um sarah anything on that last slide Maybe just listening to Rowena, maybe one, one other view, maybe just to offer. So the, the proposal to um, move from the paper-based system onto the digital-based system. So I think this also brings it back to strategy in terms of, obviously that has huge potential to be an operational risk reduction um, move in terms of how that's done. So I think in everything that we're talking about here, it's also for this particular company, seeing how they can actually exploit the risk reduction benefits of this particular strategy although noting as Rowena has has very clearly articulated there are a number of additional key risks as we've worked through the case study that come to the fore. Thanks Sarah. Um, okay after that uh, whirlwind through John's plans and um, a few questions have come through on the Q&A function um, and I know we're tight on time so we'll try and get to many as many of them as we can. So actually, Sarah, the first one is for you. So we've one comment here saying that um, the listener is really interested in hearing about your observations on the different challenge of being part of an organization, which I suppose is does digital by design, obviously Stripe, versus your previous exper experience in the in the FS sector. Thank you, and and thanks to the to the individual who asked that question. I think. This is really a fascinating topic. I could talk about it, as you know, Sarah, for, for hours, but I'll keep it brief given the time we have. I'll maybe talk about three things here. So I think maybe to bring it back to some of the points we've talked about, I think skills and capabilities to execute to whether it's a digital transformation in a company that maybe isn't, and I'll use the, the, um, the questioner's phrase, digital by design. I think that is a very specific skill set and capability that needs to be considered in that particular context. And then when we look at companies that are maybe moving to a more digital operating model, as we mentioned earlier on, once the hard work of the digital transformation is done, what are the skills and capabilities requirements in the post transformation operating model and how does that look? And how do you bring people, including customers, staff, everybody who's a stakeholder to this along the way? So whether it's training of staff in, in the new systems and ways of working and the case study has given us some great examples here. But I think also to, to consider on the customer side, I think the customer proposition can be quite different in a company that is maybe predominantly digital when looking at that for a company who has multiple channels through which they sell their products and services. So I think that's another key um, difference as well. And I also think really the capacity to execute on this change, and we've mentioned this a couple of different times, again, from the examples that the panelists have given of the complexity of this particular case study where the firm isn't predominantly digital, but is planning to do this massive digital transformation. And again, I think about it from the point of view of the business as usual agenda that plays out in the background while all of this is taking place. 
So I think there's a probably a couple of things around capabilities, capacity and customers, but it's a fascinating topic and a great question to get. Great. Um, another one that's come through, and maybe Liam, you might be able to feed into this one. Um, can the panel speak to increased digitalization inadvertently leading to financial exclusion and how can entities mitigate against this risk? Yeah, I mean, this is this is very interesting and regulators are becoming very aware of this. And you'll see, for example, in um, that there, there have been two recent sets of, of regulatory um, sort of, I wouldn't call them guidelines as such, but they're more sort of um, thought papers or issue papers from EBA and EOPA around, um, around AI in particular, the use of AI in bank and insurance business models. The EOPA one is very focused on this point and raises it a number of times, financial exclusion, and this has to be you know, center of mind in terms of any kind of AI machine learning system um, that is implemented by a bank, the bank needs, or that by an insurer, and the insurer needs to take into account the risks of financial inclusion, uh, exclusion, and mitigate against those risks, and so on. Something that that I think there is, um, and, and obviously that goes to, um, I guess, the points that Ushin made earlier, which also come up from a data protection um, point of view in terms of automated decision making, that there needs to be an appeal process. So you know, what can an entity do, practically speaking, to mitigate against that risk of exclusion? Well, what they can do is make sure that there is... I think we might have lost Lee. ...a oh. process to the financial service. Uh, but, but access to the financial service um, might be, um, you know, can, can, can um, access the service in an alternative way. What I think is much harder to deal with is digital exclusion, and I think that's what regulators just don't have an answer to, um, because the reality is that um, those who, you know, customers who are non-digitally savvy or who are digitally shy um, just are going to be increasingly excluded from financial services, and, and it's impossible really for regulators to mandate um, that organizations provide you know, equal um, speed of access and equal facility of access to services through digital and non-digital channels. Yeah, definitely. Um, I know we're really tight on time. Um, Rowena, I might just ask you one last one and sorry to all the other uh, attendees that have asked questions we haven't gotten to, but would an automated credit decisioning model be considered material outsourcing? I don't know if you can give a quick um, answer on that one. Yeah, I'll give a, a very quick answer. Um, I think that will ultimately come down to, say if you're dealing with the bank here, what exactly they're asking the service provider to do. I would expect generally that when you're dealing with, say, a, an automated credit decision model, um, and where the bank is using one of those, that the bank would actually be setting the parameters for the relevant credit assessment. So not actually asking the service provider to do that element. They would set the parameters, put that into the, 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 the tool they're using and allow it to function then on that basis. But what probably would be material outsourcing is the use of the technology underpinning that, that automated model. And um, so I think, you know, one of the key things I say that both the EBA look at and the CBI looks at is whether when you outsourcing, outsource something, if that service provider or the technology were to fail, will that affect your customers? And here, certainly, I'm sure if you're outsourcing or outsourcing your kind of technology technology solution around this and that fails, somebody couldn't get their, their credit approval through. So it probably would affect your business if that was to fail. So I'd expect the technology would be material, but on the basis that the bank would be setting the parameters, I don't think the credit decisioning piece would be a material outsourcer. Okay, great. I think, unfortunately, we're going to have to leave it there on the Q&A front, Liam. I think you might be re going to reveal the results of the poll. Yeah, the results of the poll. I think uh, Sinead has put the results up. So the first question, what did people, what did people see as the main challenge? Um, facing financial institutions embarking on digital transformation. Very interesting. Uh, and actually, um, Sarah, Sarah Brown, you identified really culture and change management as, as the sort of, I suppose, from your perspective, one of the principal practical challenges. That's way down the list. Um, so I think we've obviously got a lot of compliance people and legal people in our audience today because they put regulatory risk and uh, uh, as the uh, regulatory challenge as 
as the main challenge, followed by scarcity of, of, of people and, and difficulties of risk identification. Um, the next um, question, um, how well is your organization managing digital change? Well, good news here. 43% um, of people think their organization is managing it very well, 43% quite well. Um, but, uh, very few people think that they're excellent. Very few people, uh, thankfully, nobody thinks that they're poor. Um, or if they did, they weren't going to admit it in our survey. Um, and the last question, um, if you could allocate, great news for all the techies in the audience, if you could allocate more resources to digital change in your organization, where would you allocate them? Poor old lawyers only getting 8% of the additional resources, IT 40%, um, compliance 25% and risk 23%. So um, there we go, that's the results of the polls. Um, only just leaves uh, uh, to me to wrap this up and to say thank you very much to, uh, to the panel. Um, I learned a huge amount uh, in that discussion. I think it was, it really was a fantastic discussion. Thank you so much, Sarah Brown, our guest speaker, um, uh, for, for, for your contributions, really insightful and really added that practical, um, you know, in-house uh, operational flavor to it. Um, thanks to Dermot, Ushin, and Rowena. Thanks to Sarah for doing a terrific job as MC. And uh, we will see you in next quarter for our quarter two uh, financial regulation webinar. Thank you very much indeed. Bye-bye.